I'm informed they became felons during the pendency of the case, so I, I may not know the exact date. Uh, but let's, let's, let's go on beyond that, even if they weren't felons. Documents that we have seen provided by whistleblowers show that, in fact, all along in this program, you knew that the weapons purchased were destined for drug cartels. You knew all along that the weapons, that someone buying over 600 weapons was not buying them for sport hunting, especially 50 calibers. So do you, and I'm, my time is running lean on trying to get an answer, did you think it was a good program? It appears as though you thought it was a good program at some time. Well, well sir, as I, I said in my statement, I acknowledge now that we, we did make some mistakes in this, in this initiative, in this program. Okay. Well, I, I think we'll, we'll all acknowledge that you're right on that. Uh, when I was in Mexico, I observed a lot of things, and uh, uh, Special Agent uh, Canino, my understanding, I was told in Mexico by a number of your colleagues, you were not there at the time, that uh, when they entered into the database, into the trace database, fast and furious weapons, they got a system error. In other words, they didn't get a hit or a miss. They got a network error. Are you aware of that? Yes, sir. So when your agents, your Federal agents with 20 or more years, entered in the information that would have allowed them to contact a special agent in Phoenix, they did not get the information that would have allowed them to contact the special agent in Phoenix. Isn't that correct? That is correct, sir. I'm so not... you were blocked. Uh, yes, Mr. Gill and I have run a lot of my time with the other questions, but both for, uh, for, for both you and, uh, and, and, and Mr. Canino, if you had known about this program, were you or were you not obligated to tell the Ambassador? Sir, upon my arrival, I had discussions with the Ambassador about arms trafficking being the number one issue. Uh, the second call I would have made would have been on the ambassador. The first call I would have made would have been directly to the acting director of ATF to find out exactly what this case is all about. So in my remaining time, and Special Agent Wall, this would, of course, apply to Tijuana, too, if you are operating in a foreign nation as an American law enforcement individual, as a liaison invited on behalf of a government, not having law enforcement power in that country, don't you owe it to to the ambassador to keep him or her fully informed of anything you learn, because you are not there to do law enforcement. You are there to help them do law enforcement through the embassy. So for all three of you, uh, first three witnesses, isn't it reasonable to believe that one of the reasons that you were not told about Fast and Furious is, had you been told, in addition to the acting director, the ambassador and the rest of the State Department would have had to have been read into this program uh, considering its magnitude? Sir, um, to follow what uh, Darren said, if we weren't aware of the technique that ATF agents were actually following known gun traffickers away and letting them go, that is insane. It would inconceivable. You would not never think that because ATF does not do that. If I had known that that was in fact occurring, I would have called ATF headquarters, and if we did not get relief from them, we would have gone upstairs and told the ambassador, and hopefully he would have been able to stop it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, gentlemen, from early on in this case, various ATF agents and officials raised concerns about the number of guns purchased by fast and furious suspects that were flowing from Arizona to Mexico. Mr. Ledman, <clears throat> you testified in March 2010 that you provided a detailed briefing about Fast and Furious to Acting De uh, Deputy Director Hoover, Assistant Director Chaden, and uh, several others. Is that correct? Now, Mr. McMahon, after this March 2010 briefing, Mr. Hoover directed the Phoenix uh, field office to prepare an exit strategy to shut down the operation within 90 days. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. We did ask for an exit strategy, a okay. 30, 60, 90 day exit strategy. And in his interview, Mr. Hoover told the committee that this was the first time in his career he had ever asked for an exit strategy, but that he felt that he needed one because he was very concerned about the large number of guns being purchased by these suspects. Mr. McMahon, did you share Mr. Hoover's concern about the large number of weapons in this case uh, with, with, with others? 
Absolutely, sir. I think we were all concerned about the large number of cases, but this magnitude of a case was something we had never encountered before uh, in my career. And did you ask Mr. Newell to Special Agent Newell to provide you with an exit strategy? I did, sir. And when did the exit strategy uh, envision indictments arriving? Uh, we received the exit strategy, I believe, at the end of March, and then again. Of what year? Of, of uh, 2010. Of 10. I'm sorry. Okay. And um, we had a 30, 60, 90 day plan. If certain things were accomplished by 30 days, we would be able to do the, uh, seek indictment. If certain things were accomplished by 60 days, we would uh, attain indictments, that sort of thing. So you had more or less some kind of a time schedule, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Were you, were you following that schedule? In other words, were you checking back every 30 days, 60 days, whatever? We, we were actually, I was checking back more than that. We were, Bill and I were probably talking weekly about the activity of what was going on in the case and how, how much closer we were to completing our investigation. Well, according to that strategy from the very beginning, what was the day that you expect, expected uh, envision, uh, indictments arriving? When you first, when you, you, you did it in March, what, 2010? Correct. We, we, we were expecting indictments sometime in the summer of 2010. And I want to understand why it took from March 2010, when Mr. Hoover ordered the operation to be shut down, to January 2011, when indictments were finally issued. Can you help us with that? Well, again, we were working day to day with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and, and it is a partnership when you put a case like this together. And we thought we had enough, and the, obviously we have to prove that to the prosecutors that we have enough, and, and that does take a little bit extra time. Well, that was more than a little bit extra time, was it not? I mean, you were just, you were talking initially, I guess, by, about the summer of 2010, and you end up uh, January 2011. Uh, you're approaching a year as opposed to a few months. Is that right? Well, it was about six months, sir, yes. Now, Mr. Newell, when did you eventually shut down ATF's uh, investigative portion of this operation? Well, sir, the investigation is ongoing as we speak. But at some point, I'm talking about yes, sir. what he, we were just talking about, uh, Special Agent Newell. Yes, sir. There was a plan to shut this, this piece down, an exit strategy. Right. And I'm, I'm asking you to refer to what I just asked. <clears throat> Uh, Special Agent McMahon, Mr. McMahon, about yes, sir. Uh, when was the, what was the plan? I mean, the, the plan was uh, end of July, uh, present to the U.S. Attorney's Office what we believed to be the evidence that we needed to uh, secure the first round of indictments. Uh, and as the extra strategy said, the 90 days, 30, 60, 90 days was not a firm, uh, depending on you know what what type of investigative material or inv information we get, and that, uh, depending on each 30, you know, 60, 90 day time frame. So it was roughly about. I believe about mid-August, when we felt that we presented to the United States Attorney's Office uh, all the evidence we needed to secure a uh, first round of indictment. So in essence, we probably went over a couple of weeks. So did you, I, I assume, Mr. McMahon, did you approve uh, this going beyond the, the time period that you initially stated for the exit strategy? Is that right? There was nothing to approve, sir. It was, I was getting updates from Bill about his work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. So basically, if he said, look, we need more time. Uh, you just assume you needed more time. And he would give me a reason why we needed more time, correct? And so Mr. Issa, Chairman Issa, asked, said uh, the purpose of the program was to let guns walk. And I just want Mr. Noor and Mr. McMahon um, to, to be clear. We are trying to get to the bottom of this. We could be going to bring around the Rosie forever. What was the purpose of this uh, uh, operation? Uh, to the best of your knowledge, Mr. Uh, Special Agent uh, Newell, and then yours, uh, Mr. McMahon. Or Mr. Cummings, thank you for the question. The purpose of this investigation was to identify and disrupt and dismantle an entire firearms trafficking organization that was linked to a Mexican drug cartel. That was the purpose. Uh, and to do so, we needed an extraordinary amount of work on the part of the agents to, in fact, achieve that goal. But it was not to let guns walk. Is that no, correct? No. I don't know if you. Go ahead. No, sir. As I said in my statement, sir, uh, one of the things that that I it frustrates me to to some extent is there's that belief, and at no time in the in the in our strategy was it to allow guns to be taken to Mexico. No, sir. I don't know if you heard uh, Special Agent McNino, but he was almost in tears and very frustrated because he felt that all of this went against the very things that he stands for and these other agents stand for. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would just like for Mr. McMahon to just answer my question and then I will. Without objection. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I totally agree with you, sir. That is not in the makeup of an ATF agent. We do not allow guns to walk. 
what we did in this investigation was investigate a large group of individuals that were breaking the law, and we were trying to put our case together so that we could actually make an impact. If we pick off these one or two straw purchasers, they get replaced in a day, and we have even more guns going into Mexico. That was the plan. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize Mr. Burton for his five minutes. Uh, First of all, uh, what, uh, Agent Newell, what was the uh, origin of this program? Who, who came up with this idea? Where did it come from? Well, sir, it was based on, it was based on the fact that uh, when we, the OSTEF Strike Force was initiated, uh, it, the idea of the OSTEF program is to disrupt and dismantle entire organizations. The DOJ so, wh wh who came up with this idea? Was it you or Mr. McMahon or somebody higher up the food chain? I, idea for what, sir? For the whole program. It is it's one investigation, sir. Uh, Fast and Furious is one investigation. Well, who, where, where, where was, I mean, the selling of the guns or the giving of the guns in Fast and Furious, where did that come from? Who, who made that decision? Well, sir, we have a policy that allows for those transfer of firearms in order to pr pursue uh, targets and investigation to identify other okay, Well, there were 2,000, as I understand, there were as many as 2,000 firearms. Is that correct? That is approximately yes, sir. And, and, and you were allowed to allow 2,000 firearms to go uh, in this system, this Fast and Furious program. Uh, how were you tracking those? Well, sir, Fast and Furious, uh, I apologize, but Fast and Furious was not a program. It was an investigation that was Okay. Well, how, was it, how did you track the weapons, the 2,000 weapons? Well, depending on how the, how the information got to us. It, sometimes the information got to us after the sale. Sometimes it got to us through investigative means, that firearms were Did you have a set of records that showed who, who got them and, and who reported to you where they went and all that? So through, our, through our tracing system, we, we have a way to determine when firearms were seized, and we also received information. On, on all the firearms, did you get uh, uh, this information? No, I don't believe so, no, sir. Why not? Why not? We didn't get all the information? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you have 2,000 firearms that are out there that are going th in, in, the, in the program or the investigation, and you are putting them out there, it seems to me you would want to, if you are trying to make a case, you would want to track those and know where all of them went. We, well, we did track the ones that we knew about, yes, sir. Well, there were 2,000 firearms. Did you have control of those at any time? We seized, sir, over uh, approximately 300 guns in this case in the United States through our efforts. Um, and the other firearms we put into our suspect gun database. Well, I must be missing something. You had 2,000 firearms. Yes, sir. You put them into the system, into the, into the investigation, correct? I did not, no, sir. Wh who did? Uh, agents in the group, agents in Group 7. Okay. Well, who kept records of that? The agents that were doing it, did anybody keep records who they were giving the guns to? Sir, um, I, I'm a little. The, the weapons were being purchased by a criminal organization. Um, okay. So when we found out about that information, be it through weapon seizures or through cooperating dealers or through other means, we would keep track of that. Yes. Sir. So you have a record of all of the weapons that were put into the into the, that were sold. To this day, we're still discovering more because this was a very prolific firearms trafficking organization. When we first initiated this investigation in November of 2009, I believe the number was they had already purchased that we believe to this day, the number changes, something like 400 firearms. By the time we initiated our OSADEF strategy, 